All right, well, like I said, CSA is community supported agriculture. We'll dive a little bit into what they are, um, a little brief history of how they began. We'll talk about the steps to think about when creating your own CSA. Um, if you look back on the uh, slide, Thank you. So yeah, what's the CSA? A little bit of history, um, the benefits to you as a farmer of operating this kind of business model, and then like I said, some steps for creating your own. So we'll dig into things to think about when creating a CSA plan. Um, things to think about for marketing um, to reach potential customers and different tools you can use. We'll touch on some crop planning considerations um, and then dive into the nitty gritty of CSA logistics and program management, um, as well as member communication, and then wrap up that piece with a little bit of discussion on member recruitment and growth. Um, so, how you can think about um, if you start your own CSA in the first year, who are the folks you might connect with that will buy directly from you? Um, and then after that first season, if you're thinking about growing your CSA program, um, how you can recruit returning members and then also grow your membership base, try and make some more income off your CSA model. Um, I also have a few uh, resources that I'd like to share with you from both the Food Group website and um, a CSA work that Kazi was just sent to me the other week. Um, so I'll share those at the end of the session, and then we'll open it up for some questions and answers as well. This graphic on the right side is um, just a, a fun kind of colorful example of a social media ad um, that we created that includes some of the, um, you can see all the like vegetables on the side of this slide. Those are kind of some of the brand um, assets or like, digital graphics that the food group uses throughout all of our marketing materials and advertising. Um, I don't see a problem around this room, but if you see like the signs with the logos for the food group on it, well, I guess this is one, this giant one right so up to me. <clears throat> but yeah, so this is just an example of an ad that incorporated some of those design elements from like a branding perspective um, that we've done some media in the past when we had the Big River Farms aggregate CSA. Um, yeah, so just a fun little social media ad. Okay, so what is CSA? Like I mentioned, it stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Um, you can think of it as a direct sales model. So similar to um, selling to a customer directly um, through something like a market stand or a farmer's market. Another opportunity to sell direct. Um, it is a subscription model. Um, so we'll dive into what that means in a little bit here, but essentially you're creating a product with your CSA shares and you're recruiting members to join your CSA program. Um, and they essentially subscribe to your CSA and receive boxes of parties from you um, in exchange for giving you that upfront financial payment. Um, it is also a way for customers to buy directly from you while supporting your farm. So this just plays into that direct sales model, again, focused on like establishing relationships directly with people that you're selling to, as opposed to going through a wholesale buyer or a distributor. Um, this model of um, the subscription model, the CSA model is a great way to like create some of those relationships that'll be um, hopefully longer lasting than just one season um, and connecting directly with the people you're selling to. Uh, it's also a business model that ensures you receive fair prices for your produce. So I think we probably talked about this briefly um, at several previous classes in discussing wholesale accounts. 
um, or some of the things like, you know, farm to school programs, grocery stores, food co-ops, um, senior living facilities, um, anywhere that purchases food from you and then resells it to um, their community or their students or folks who live there. Um, and oftentimes in wholesale accounts, the benefit is that you don't have to grow as much variety of produce for something like a direct market, like farmer's market or CSA, and you grow larger quantities of less amounts of produce. Um, so it's a little bit easier to manage from the farm perspective. Um, but the wholesale uh, model oftentimes will pay maybe like 70 to 75 percent of what you would receive if you just sold it direct through a model like CSA or at a farmer's market. Um, and that's usually to cover any like margin they're trying to make or any of their overhead for paying staff or um, like infrastructure use, buildings, trucks, that kind of thing. So you can always get that that fair price, that whole market value when you sell direct through something like a CSA or a farmer's market. And it's also to tie it back into the name, a model that's supported directly by your community. Um, so that's a big piece of, of this model and how it was developed. Um, again, is like establishing that relationship with the folks that you're selling directly to. And this is a nice example of one of the past big River Farms CSA shares. Um, lots of lots of delicious, fresh-looking produce. Um, you can see there's maybe I'll say 12, just off the top of my head, 12, 13 different items in that photo. So this would be an example of a, a large or a full share. And we'll kind of talk about share sizes and um, what that can look like. But yeah, so they've all been boxed up and, and delivered to either a customer directly, a CSA member, or um, taken to a drop site partner that you would establish prior to launching the CSA sales and prior to harvesting and delivering. And we'll get into that a little bit more here in the next few slides as well. All right, a little bit more about what a CSA is. Um, like I mentioned, a way for folks to buy local food directly from you, local farmers. Um, earlier I said that it was a subscription model. It's a um, box-based model, right? So. You would pack boxes or uh, CSA shares, and the members who sign up or subscribe to your CSA would be farm members. And CSA members that choose where to count their share of those uh, boxes of produce from you. Um, and again, this is from a list of available drop sites that you provide uh, when selling your CSA memberships. Um, some examples from the past big River farm CSA. We had several, I think we, we ended up having 14 different drop sites um, throughout the cities and close to the farm um, to provide a bunch of different options to make it convenient for folks. Um, regardless of where they lived or worked, um, there was more than one or two options to make it a little bit more accessible. Use the farm, which is always a great option. If you have your own CSA at Big River, you can use Big River Farms as a pickup spot for your CSA. Um, because we're a part of the food group where we are right now, this was one of our drop sites um, for people to pick up their CSA boxes. And then we also worked with um, some longtime CSA members who were just like excited to support us in other ways and offered up their homes. Um, you know, maybe they had a backyard or a screened in porch that they offered up to us. So they were subscribing to our CSA and they were also being one of those drop site partners. So we have several folks who did that. Um, we worked with a bunch of retail businesses and reached out to them and asked if they'd be willing to be drop site hosts. So we delivered CSA shares to um, an independent bookstore, um, a birthing center for new mothers, which was a nice tie into like health, personal and family health and eating healthy fresh food. Um, we a few craft breweries um, and a handful of churches as well um, and connected with their community that attended their churches. So something to think about when you're creating or reaching out to potential um, folks to service drop sites. 
So think about that convenience factor, like where they're located, if it's close to the farm, if they're closer to where you live, or if they're close to a potential customer you're trying to engage, um, as well as you know, reaching out to businesses that maybe have similar values or align with your business. Um, but yeah, yeah, let me go to your question. So, um, if, if the is in the future, so let's say you live in a community and people are interested in boxing up everything or whatever it is, and distribute to them. I used to be out of, I don't want to be in a people's course yet, and I'm kind of going kind to of go uh, for what kind of changes. <laughs> and I wake up in what I say, what for them to do with that step. Yeah. And so they distribute to individuals. So does you guys do that? Uh, we did not in the past. That's definitely an option though when you're thinking about doing your own CS thing, especially in that first year. I would suggest starting small and maybe you know you're trying to recruit like five to 15 members that first year who maybe you already have a personal relationship with, whether it's friends or family or um, members of your church congregation, um, and then kind of grow from there. Um, so that could be an option, yeah, for the first year. Just if, you're, if you have that capacity to deliver directly to people's homes yeah. um, or places of work, that's an option. Um, we didn't do it because our TFA was fairly large. We had 235 members uh, and 14 different drop sites. So that was the route that we went. Um, but yeah, something to think about. And also a, a potential option for you if you start an independent CSA. So what about drop sites? Um, and like I mentioned, you provide those CSA members who sign up with a box of vegetables, or it could be other, other uh, farm products that you're either growing or creating, um, such as fruit. Uh, Big River Farms for years worked with two local um, organic fruit growers, Mason Fieldwater and Menominee, Wisconsin, which is nearby, just on the western border of Wisconsin. Um, and we did that partly as a way to like highlight and promote other farmers who were doing similar work related to sustainable agriculture and to provide another option for CSA members to try and get additional subscriptions and additional funds up front at the end of, or at the end of the season um, to support our management of that um, CSA program. Um, so you can do this yourself, right? If you're growing fruits, if you're renting some of the perennial plots of big rivers like the strawberries or the asparagus, um, you can include those as add-ons that CSA members can purchase from you when they sign up for your vegetable fairs. Or similarly, you could work with other farmers in the local area who might um, you might have a relationship with or folks who are searching for markets of their own. Um, a good example of this is Moshni Farms, who's been at Big River for maybe four years, um, has had a vegetable CSA, and they've partnered with some other local farmers that they have a relationship with who raise um, chickens. And so on their like sign up form on their website, they had the two different sizes of vegetable chairs that members could sign up for. And then they had um, these add ons or like additional items that members could sign up for. And that was provided by this other farm they had a relationship with. So you could buy a vegetable fare from them and then you could add on, um, I think it was like a monthly delivery of um, chickens for people to eat. And then also an egg share. Um, so we got like a dozen eggs once a week for vegetables. Some other ideas, value added products. We've talked about this um, briefly at a few other market classes, but if you wanna create something that's canned or fermented um, or dried, like if you're growing flowers and drying them for tea, um, that could be something that you yourself grow and then process and create and include as an add-on to your vegetable CSA. Again, it's just another way to like bring in some more revenue, get some additional money um, and provide other options to members when they sign up for your CSA. Um, a few other ideas, meat, I mentioned chickens. Um, there's a few local farmers who are cattle producers who partner up with local um, vegetable farmers and they'll do kind of an aggregated CSA of their own. They'll, they'll, they'll operate and manage it and you can sell your produce to them and they use that as kind of an add-on for their meat CSA shares for 
um, beef and chicken. Um, and I've seen people partner with like local bakeries, the local um, bread bakers, to provide that as an add on as well. You can get really creative with it. You know, it doesn't have to be food based. Um, part of the CSA model is, which we'll dive into in a bit here, is member communications. Um, so the model, in addition to being that subscription model and that like produce box model, um, typically includes a weekly update from you as a farmer or as the business owner and operator. Um, and those can include stories, like personal stories from you as a farmer, um, the things you're excited about, issues you're having at the farm and how that's impacted, um, crop harvest, um, personal information about your business, your values, um, all sorts of stuff. So we'll get into that a little bit more here coming up. But just wanted to touch base on that quickly. Oftentimes, um, CSA farmers will use this, this phrase, shared risk and shared reward. That's kind of a tagline for what a CSA is all about, or to market it to potential members or customers. So essentially, it's this kind of like reciprocal relationship you're trying to establish as a farmer, as a business owner with um, new customers. So it's a shared risk because the model is set up in a way where people sign up for that CSA subscription or that share from you as a farmer, um, typically at the beginning of the season, before you put plants in the ground, before you've started seeds, before you've transplanted or harvested anything. Um, so there's a bit of a shared risk there because they're opting into supporting your business without receiving anything up front of you, except for that guarantee that you'll be growing produce and distributing it to them throughout the season. Um, and there's risks on your side, right? As a farmer, there's always risks for farming as far as weather, pests, crop issues, um, all sorts of variables that go into farming. So shared risks and the shared rewards for you as the farmer is getting those customers, establishing those relationships, um, having a market, to sell your vegetables to, that direct market to people. Um, and the share rewards on the member side is getting all the fresh produce from you. So you'll often see that describing what CSAs are. This is just a fun graphic that we had on our website when Big River Farms used to operate an aggregated CSA. Um, I thought it did a, a, a good job of just like simplifying the process and showing how it works. So like I mentioned, upfront customers will buy a share or a box of produce from you as the farmer. They'll subscribe to your CSA. Um, you'll be growing and harvesting food and packing boxes of delicious red produce. Go back to that first slide. There's a good example, right, of a wax cardboard box that might be one of your CSA shares with a variety of different produce in it that you're delivering to folks. And then we used to do weekly deliveries, but that's really up to you as a farmer and a business owner, how often you want to be harvesting and packing and how often you'd like to be delivering. Um, so several things to take into consideration there, right? It's just your time, um, your capacity for labor, if you have any assistance from coworkers, farm owners, family or friends that you're farming with. Um, Similar to before when I mentioned like, it's great to start small and kind of scale up over time as you learn more and gain more experience. Um, that same kind of train of thought can be put in place when thinking about deliveries. Um, you know, maybe your first year you're starting with again like five to 15 members and instead of doing weekly deliveries, maybe you're doing every other week for several months. <clears throat> and that can make it a little bit easier to manage when it's a brand new thing, and especially if you're doing it independently without support from other coworkers or friends or family. Um, you can also do a monthly option um, instead of weekly or bi-weekly. It's really all up to you and, and what you're trying to sell and what your financial goals are for your CSA. All right, so we'll dive into more like step-by-step -step what to think about when creating a CSA. But I want to do a brief history of CSAs and how they began. Um, Dr. Booker T. Wally is considered kind of the godfather of CS the CSA model and the CSA movement in the US. So there's a picture of him on the bottom right there. 
a little bit about Dr. Dr. Booker T. Wally. He was a horticulturalist, um, an agricultural professor at Tuskegee University in Alabama. He was also a really big advocate for regenerative agriculture practices and other environmental practices. And really was like a good local, um, as far as U.S. pioneer of sustainable agriculture um, and being an advocate for sustainable agriculture practices post World War II. So from like the 50s to the 70s, he was very active from both a teaching perspective and advocacy perspective um, and connecting with local folks in his community. He first introduced the CSA model in the 60s um, as a way to promote um, self-sufficiency um, and, and uh, more agency for struggling black farmers um, and really based on that economic model of like having a guaranteed market connecting directly with customers in the black community that wanted to support them um, and supporting their agricultural businesses. A little bit more information about Dr. Wally. Um, as you're probably aware, there's not been a whole lot of support from the federal government in the US because of systemic racism connected to our, our founding and our history as a country. Um, so he really saw this as a way for black farmers to keep their farmland uh, while supporting their communities. And he advocated for your own farm models to try and reduce some of the labor costs, which is something you can think about if you're creating your own CSA is inviting those customers, inviting those members to come to the farm and like actually pick some of the produce themselves. Yeah, or so that's allowed if you do or you have people come in. Um I'm 99 percent sure yes, but I'll check with Kadra. I know during like the first two years of COVID, there were some pretty like strong restrictions on that. And we were trying to figure out all the safety precautions. But uh last year I know the farm got opened up more for just like public events um for more volunteers to come. Um, and for CSA members to come back. So I'm pretty certain you can, but I'll double check with Kajra. So I have to be so ready. Nice. Like you know, people. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, either way, even if you can't have people come to like their own stuff, you can definitely, I'm 100% sure that you can nice. invite people to just pick up those shares. And, yeah, to meet you as a farmer to get into the group of farm. But yeah, I'll double check on that piece, Ori. Um, so yeah, pick your own as an option instead of you harvesting everything and packing everything, maybe inviting folks to come pick some fresh produce. And again, build that relationship you know, with your members, customers, and also I think oftentimes people who have no direct connection to farming can romanticize it, especially if they live in a city and there's that geographical disconnect from who's growing their food and where it's coming from, how it's grown. So that's another like great free soft marketing tool that you can use. It's inviting those customers, inviting those members to the farm to meet you, to see how you're growing things, to get that hands-on experience and create more of um, not just a sale or a transaction like we've talked about in other classes, but establish relationships and provide an experience, right? I think that that's one of the great things about direct markets is that it's not just a sale. It plays into the, that piece of like, creating an experience um, similar to what we talked about at the farmer's market class, right? Where you're engaging people directly, not only with visuals and like bright displays and colorful produce, but also with smells and tastes and sounds. So that's a good opportunity to invite people to meet you at the farm and, and get that experience from you directly. Um, before CSAs were CSAs, Dr. Watley uh, dubbed them clientele membership clubs, which eventually evolved into the CSA model we know today. So these membership clubs offered community members an opportunity to pay black farmers upfront in exchange for guaranteed season of fresh local food, and also again, guarantee those farmers uh, market customers and sustainable business for the long term. And finally, the CSA movement grew out of a recognition, again, like I mentioned earlier, that there wasn't support for black farmers from the federal government, primarily the USDA, in the 60s and 70s. Um, to a certain extent, you probably know that's still true today. And so the idea behind this model was that African-American farmers 
would search out for that support directly within the community instead of relying on state or federal government agencies. One final note. Like I mentioned, he was a big advocate of regenerative agriculture and other environmental practices. So he believed in not only regenerating the soil, but also the livelihoods of black farmers. He embraced the notion of direct marketing when creating these clientele membership clubs. And it enabled farmers to not only get that guaranteed market and those relationships with customers and their community, but also to plan for production or crop planning. Um, to anticipate demand for your business model and for your farm. And again, to have a guaranteed market. So what are the benefits besides some of the things we've already talked about of CSA? Um, like I mentioned, there's that self-sufficiency piece, right? You have more agency as a farmer and a business owner. You're not relying on third parties to sell for you or to distribute for you. There's that guaranteed direct market, like we spoke about, uh, as well as fair prices for your produce, getting that top um, organic certified price, that price premium, and not having any of it taken by distributor, distributors or resellers or buyers. Uh, it helps build customer relationships, and it can build long-term brand recognition, which is great for your business, um, and customer loyalty. Um, so customer service is a big piece of CSAs and communication, like I mentioned earlier, um, to kind of not only establish and build those relationships, but to keep them in the long term um, and encourage folks to support your business from one year to the next. So helping to build that brand recognition and that customer loyalty can result in future referrals. So maybe we'll have mouth referrals from CSA members who return the next year and then really enjoy your farm, really enjoy meeting you, really enjoy all the fresh, fresh, delicious produce that you're giving to them. Um, and they invite their family or their friend or their coworkers. So that's a way to get some free marketing from, through other people, through your members, um, and also an opportunity to grow your membership base from one year to the next. Like I mentioned, no third party buyer or distributor is needed. So you have a little bit more control over what you're growing and how you're distributing it. And then that financial support up front. Um, I've seen this model, the financial piece of this puzzle kind of evolve and grow over the years. Uh, so it started with that, that the kind of traditional model where members would pay you the full price for the full season um, up front, you know, maybe from like January through May, they'll sign up for the CSA and you know, say you have one share size that's $500 for the whole season for like five months of deliveries. You would get all that money up front from them, gives you that financial support right away as you're planning, and then you can use those funds to purchase seeds, supplies, um, any infrastructure needs, um, and that money towards your business finances. So it's nice to have that money up front. Um, it can also help you plan for <coughs> income expenses and play into your your business plan um, and, and how you're diversifying your market opportunities or your sales opportunities and how you're receiving income from different sales and options that you're pursuing. Um, the way that that model has evolved over time is that a lot of uh, more established CSA firms now will offer multiple options for their CSA members as a way to um, be more inclusive and accessible to folks who want to support them. So, for example, in the past, when Big River had our aggregated CSA model, we offered a few different payment plan options for folks when they signed up. We had that more like traditional model where people would pay the full price at the front um, if, they, if that was financially viable for them. We also had a payment plan option through the software management company we used called Harvey, where it was, it was marketed as 50, 25, no, 25, 25, and 50, the model. So people, when they signed up online, would pay an initial 25% of the total cost. 
The next 25% would be due the first day of deliveries in mid June when we made that first CSA share delivery. And then the remaining 50% was split up over the whole season. So once a week, they would be charged a part of that 50% total that still exists on their account. Does that make sense? Um, so our CSA ran for 18 weeks. And so they might pay like, you know, a hundred and some dollars up front when they signed up, another hundred dollars on that first delivery day. And then every week for 18 weeks, they might be charged like 12 to $18 per delivery. So a way to make it more um, convenient, more accessible from that financial perspective, you can think about setting up something similar when you create your CSA based on what your um, goals are. And another lovely picture in the back of a full CSA share with lots of parties. <clears throat> All right. Do a little bit of a deep dive into steps for creating your CSA and what to think about as you're planning your own, if that's something you're interested in. First, think about what your financial goals are in establishing a CSA. Um, identify the price of your share size or your share or, or multiple if you're doing multiple different sizes of shares. Um, and ensure that the total cost that you're receiving from your members covers your expenses. So you can think of things like, you know, boxes if you're buying those to distribute, um, seeds, tools, equipment, gas for your truck or your delivery vehicle. So do some, um, some financial planning and figure out what your goals are with your CSA. Um, like I mentioned with the payment plan options, this can be a good opportunity to think about you know, maybe you're offering discounted shares for folks on government assistance. Um, so that was something that we did with the Bigger River Farms CSA for folks that were getting electronic um, benefit transfers or EBT from the federal government, the SNAP program and the WIC program, which are both supplemental food programs um, to try and increase, again, that accessibility so that you're not only selling to folks who have the financial means to pay you in full upfront if that's part of your your plan and your goals. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. Those programs do they support you like you know these weak benefits by that apply to CSA groups? Yeah, good question. Um, so it kind of depends on the market and the model you're offering. So the way that we did it was there's a Nonprofit based in Madison, Wisconsin, called Fairness Care CSA Coalition. And they provide like educational support, financial, and marketing support to CSA farmers throughout the Midwest. So Big River always applied and was a sponsored member of their nonprofit for an annual fee. And then they have all sorts of like resources and uh, support that they provide to you. So one of those was something they called a partnership program, which was an opportunity for us to um, connect with and promote our CSA to folks receiving those types of government assistance. Um, so something you could look into, I can share that information with you if you're interested. Um, I know Pierce and Eleanor just joined Fair Share this season to, to offer that for their CSA program. Um, so essentially it's like subsidized through farm memberships to this program, to the Fair Share program. And then People would apply through Fair Care and they have like a website listing all the farms that are a part of their uh, nonprofit. And so people will go into their website, sign up for a CSA, choose the farm they want to purchase from, and submit some sort of documentation to say, um, here's my government assistance plan, this is what I'm receiving. Um, and then they get anywhere from 25 to 75 percent of their share costs covered through those farm membership fees. Um, and that's a way for them to join and support your CSA um, without having the, the total financial means to right up front and getting some subsidies from this other nonprofit. So yeah, I can definitely share that with you if you're interested. Um, maybe think about farmers markets too. I do probably aware of this, but there's lots of farmers markets in the Twin Cities and throughout Minnesota and Western Wisconsin that uh, offer that option for folks using EBT or SNAP or WIC benefits at the farmers market. Um, to receive additional free funds, like matching funds, to essentially double their their purchasing power. So you'll see that at the Kingfield Farmers Market if you're if you're selling there this year. 
um, they have a program like that that their market manager um, implements them overseas. So like somebody might have an EBT card with $10 on it, and we'll go to the info booth to get tokens in exchange for that. And we'll also get an additional free ten dollars, so they'll they'll double their their benefits as a way to try and support local farmers and farmers markets and get more health healthy fresh food to um, folks who might not have the financial means to always purchase it. Yeah, Jeff. Um, another thing that I think is um, a little unique um, and it's become more prevalent in the past several years with. Uh, COVID happening and protests happening is that mutual aid has popped up again, um, kind of in the mainstream as a model, as a community supported financial model or a uh, resource model for people supporting other people in their community. Again, without having to rely on government agencies, whether it's city, state, or federal. So you can think about how to incorporate that into your CSA uh, model and plan. Um, I know some farmers have offered what they call a solidarity share for their CSA signups, um, kind of as an internal, like farmer managed subsidy program um, for folks with limited access um, or financial means. So I've seen that, that show up on like on a sign up sheet for CSA members that farmers put out, where maybe they'll have this like additional option. So say they have like a small CSA share, a large CSA share, and then a solidarity share. And folks who have the financial means can sign up for a solidarity share. And maybe that means they're paying the full cost for like a large share and they're getting the small share and then the other small share is being distributed for free to folks who apply. Um, so another kind of cool financial model um, that again is a little bit more inclusive. Um, and encourages more folks to participate and receive their produce. Um, and again, create that kind of reciprocal relationship. Finally, um, going back to the, the first piece, can you break it even or make a profit um, based on how you're pricing your shares and, and what your goal is for members? Um, something to think about when you're planning. How many shares of members would this require to break even or to make a profit? And again, think about, you know, starting in your first year, you're probably not making a profit. Maybe you're breaking even, but more likely than not, you're probably um, losing some cash. But in future years, as you learn more and you build your membership base and your customers, um, you're kind of slowly working towards that, you know, three to five year plan of breaking even and then making a profit and growing your membership base. Uh, share types, sizes, Delivery frequency and prices. Like I mentioned, you can have any number of share types. The most common that I've seen is two, um, small and large, or they have also been referred to as half and full size shares. Um, like I mentioned before, it's great to start off um, in your first year with just offering one type to make it a little bit more manageable for yourself, uh, and then growing and expanding in future years. Um, share types goes back to that idea of, you know, are you growing vegetables? Are you doing fruit shares? Do you have value added products um, that you're promoting either as independent or add on CSAs, CSA shares? Delivery frequency, we talked about a little bit, but you know, you can, you can do it weekly, you can do it bi weekly. If it's more of a value added thing um, or something like poultry or cattle, maybe you're doing a delivery once a month. And then prices, price out again, the seeds, the boxes, your expenses, um, and how much you'd like to sell those for. Uh, this is a good opportunity for doing some research again. So I can share a few online websites that have, there's a few like major CSA directories that the Department of Agriculture and their Minnesota Growing Program uh, hosts and Land Stewardship Projects, which is another local environmental um, nonprofit, farming advocacy nonprofit. They have a big online CSA directory. So check those out. They have like maps and then full lists of hundreds of farmers throughout the state and their CSA offerings. And usually they have a website link. So you can go and see their share sizes, the types they offer, the prices that they're listing them at um, to get a sense of what you can price your CSA shares for. 
Think about access to farmland and how much you have or what your acreage is um, and how that can support your CSA goals and the variety of crops that you're planning to grow. Um, the BRF CSA, we had the two sizes, the small and the large. The small on average had seven to 10 different items in it on a weekly basis, and the large had 12 to 15 items. So something to think about when you're creating your gear types and sizes, and also how you're uh, marketing them and promoting them to members for signups. Um, it's nice to have that flexibility and that variability on both ends, so that you know if for some reason there's crop loss or things don't germinate as quickly and, and aren't ready to harvest as quickly as you had planned, there's some flexibility on your end. So maybe one week, you know, you have six or seven items and the following week you have 10 or 11 in a small share just to kind of make up for things that were missing the previous week. Um, same thing on the member side, it just sets that expectation that yes, farming is very variable. There's a lot of things that go into it. Um, lots of things can happen in real time that change what's ready to harvest or what's ready to deliver. So setting that expectation up front with members too is important um, to build that variability into how you're promoting your CSA. Um, I touched on this a little bit, but yeah, think about your capacity to manage a CSA as far as your time, the amount of labor or assistance you have from other folks that you're farming with, um, what your support needs are, and what your skill sets are. Um, I've seen really good examples of farmers at Big River who have started their own CSAs, and maybe it's a two or three person team. Um, and it's worked really well. A few folks have done this, or maybe there's one person who's really focused on the farming side of things, right? Seed starting, transplanting, uh, growing and harvesting, weeding, processing things for delivery, washing. And then another farm partner who's much more focused on kind of the program management and administrative side of things for the CSA. So maybe they're doing outreach to potential drop sites and establishing those relationships. Um, maybe the parents who are in charge of setting up a way online for members to sign up and subscribe to your CSA or developing a website or social media pages. Um, they can also be the folks who are doing that ongoing like weekly communication or bi-weekly communication with your members once they sign up and creating and developing those newsletters um, and sending updates about the farm and what's in the box and sharing recipes with customers. Um, so that's been a really positive way that people have kind of shared those, those roles and responsibilities and managed the various tasks that come with managing a CSA program. Um, if you don't have existing skills or um, it's not something you enjoy is doing that communication piece and that member recruitment piece, um, note that in your plan, right? Maybe you're really passionate about the farming piece, but um, either don't care or don't have the existing skill sets to do the communication piece. So think about if you need to hire somebody part-time or if you have a family member or a friend who's um, really experienced in that, or again, somebody else that you're farming with who's part of your farm team that can take on that piece of process. Uh, think about your business values as a farmer. Um, why are you growing organically? Who do you want to connect with as a customer? Um, how can those business values that you personally as a farmer and a business owner hold be reflected in your CSA? So maybe in the way that you market it, you know, you say it's certified organic produce, doesn't use any toxic chemicals or pesticides to grow, and you're really focused on environmental health and human health. Um, those can really play to your advantage when you're marketing and promoting your CSA and trying to build those relationships. Um, so again, that is, it's not only that transactional piece of signing up and giving you money, but um, convincing people why they should do that in the first place and connecting with them on a, um, an emotional level or that kind of values-based level as opposed to just transactional of here's what I'm growing, here's, here's the amount of money I'd like to accept for it. Um, membership recruitment and sign-up strategies. I'll get into this more at the end when we talk about ongoing member recruitment and ways to retain customers. Um, but what I would mention it here too, um, like I mentioned before, it's great to start off small and connect with those folks you already have established relationships with, family, friends, coworkers. Um, that's essentially low-hanging fruit because you already have those connections. Um, and then think about for future years, 
you know, who your preferred audience or preferred customers are and, and how you will reach out to them or how you'll connect and market your CSA. And finally, like I talked about a little bit, is the drop site host piece of the puzzle. Um, like I mentioned, you can use Playgrove River Farms as a payroll spot, so that's free and included in the program. Um, if you have space where you live, whether you own a place or rent a place that's accessible, you can think about using that if you don't have any rules or restrictions in place. Um, again, as another free alternative. Um, it's a good opportunity for like cross promotion and cross integration between your various markets. So if you're selling uh, independently at a farmer's market, um, you could ask their market manager or their staff members if you could use your stall booth at the farmer's market as another pickup spot for your CSA members. So that's a great way to like use existing resources that you've already paid for um, and established if you have a vendor permit at a farmer's market. Um, and free in the sense that you're not paying extra to use that space or to, to access that space. It's also a great way to um, get people to buy from you in different methods. So say you have a CSA pickup at your farmer's market stand and you have you know 10 to 15 items in the box, but you're also selling produce that day at the farmer's market that isn't in the box or value-added products that aren't included in your CSA. It's a good way to get that additional sales from existing CSA members by selling um, produce and then also offering that you know, at a farmer's market. Um, and the last piece that I'll mention is uh, in addition to like reaching out to potential retail businesses, especially if they align with your personal and farm business values, um, check out some local CSAs or local food co-ops. Um, we talked about that a little bit earlier this week when we had our wholesale buyers forum, but there's a really great local food co cooperative scene not only in the Twin Cities, but throughout the state and in Western Wisconsin as well. Um, Minnesota has the highest number per capita of uh, food cooperative grocery stores in the country. Um, and it's a great resource to tap into because uh, their values are based around community ownership um, instead of um, making a profit for shareholders somewhere else. They're really, their values lie really closely to connecting and supporting local farmers and providing a retail setting to sell those products. Um, and a lot of local food co-ops, especially in the Twin Cities, will offer for free their grocery store settings as drop sites or as pickup spots for your CSA. Um, so something to think about and some folks you could potentially reach out to um, also for free. A little bit more about share sizes and types for some nice visuals. Um, that photo on the left is an example of a small or half size CSA share. Looks like about six items in that. And then the photo on the right is from the same farmer, um, an example of one of their full shares, um, you know, with maybe like 12, 13 items in it. Just to give you an example of the different size options. And then that bottom photo is a picture of one of the fruit shares that we used to offer as part of the Blue River Farms CSA program from that farmer that we partnered with in Stillwater. Um, he grew a lot of organic fruit at his farm, and then he also sourced things from the Pacific Northwest that didn't grow in our climate. So things like grapes and stone fruit. Um, those avocados definitely are not local. <laughs> Okay, so you've created your business or your CSA plan, your business plan, how you're gonna create and provide um, your shares to members. The next step I would suggest is creating a CSA marketing plan. So how are you distributing information and sharing information about your CSA offerings? Um, how are you engaging customers uh, and letting them know what you have and what they can purchase from you? So the first step is identifying your target audience or customers, which we talked about a little bit. Who do you want to sell to? How does that align with your business values? Um, next, identify your marketing support needs and skills. Similar to that previous slide, if you have some existing skills in marketing or communications and you're really excited about it, maybe it's something that you can do um, as a farmer and a business owner. 
and we can decide, you know, again, we need like a family member or um, a friend or pay somebody part time to do some of those um, marketing and communication uh, things for your business, for your CSA. Similar to um, identifying your budget and your expenses for things like seeds and tools, um, accessing land, identify a budget for your marketing needs. Um, and again, you can start small and scale up as you grow your CSA. Um, maybe at first you're just using, you know, $20, $30 to run some targeted social media ads to in zip codes close to where you are or where you live or where your drop sites are established. Um, next, identify what tools we use or what resources you'll really use to share that information. Two big uh, categories you can think about here are digital and print materials. For digital, would be something like social media, which I mentioned, um, establishing or building out a website that's branded with your farm business logo, and photos of you and your crops. Something that's very like visually engaging and represents your brand. Um, print materials. You can think of things like flyers, postcards. Um, business cards, just different ways that you can provide those hard copy designed uh, materials to potential members. So this big photo on the right is an example of a flyer that New River Farms created in the past about our CSA. Um, we use a tool, I think it's been talked about before with you all in the like markets and marketing class called Canva. It's a free, um, they have paid subscription models, but it's also a free option. Uh, and it's a very user-friendly online tool with all sorts of like templates and different graphics and images and photos that you can use to create um, materials that you can then print off. So that's how this flyer on the right was created. It was in, in that program Canva that I mentioned. Um, pretty straightforward. It's got you know a beautiful photo of one of our um, CSA shares with lots of produce in it, has our name in it. Talks a little bit. There's that graphic again about what a CSA is. Um, a little blurb just talking about who we are and what we do. And then a website link for people to go and sign up, as well as our social media handles and several um, several logos just to give people a sense of what all is included in our CSA. So you see the USDA organic logo down there, um, the SNAP logo, since we were in that program, we could accept um, SNAP recipients who receive those benefits. Minnesota Grown, which comes with, um, it's basically a label and a logo that comes with a membership through the Department of Agriculture each year. They have a, um, a cost growth program and also they offer these logos as another like marketing opportunity to just tell other people and customers that yes, you're local, you're growing here um, and trying to connect with people who want to support local farmers. So that's also on our farmer's market banner, um, that logo to so know that all are local and growing locally. All right, finally, to the plants, which I'm sure you're all excited about. Crop planning. Um, how many different types of produce do you need to put into each of your hair sizes? Or like I said, if you're starting, you just have one hair size, how much produce and how much variety you want in each one, and what are you pricing to that? Um, after you figure that out, you can you know, purchase seeds. Um, you can develop a succession planting schedule, which I would highly recommend for CSAs, which ensures that you have enough produce a whole season that you're advertising to your members. Um, so start early in the spring, you know, with things like leafy greens, spinach, lettuce, herbs, um, spring onions. Um, and then you develop your usual kind of seasonal plan, but then make sure that, you know, late summer, early fall, you've, you've gotten that succession plan in place so that you have, you know, enough variety to still place into your box each week um, based on how you're advertising it. Something to think about just in general, but especially for CSA too, is how we, how we lay out your beds in your plot. Um, to do things like maximize your space to harvest efficiently. Um, if you have some wholesale markets that you're selling to, think about how 
you're laying out your beds to balance your wholesale crops versus your direct market crops. Um, and then how are you laying out your beds to allow for succession planting? And finally, how many seeds do you need to meet your goals? Um, I think this was also mentioned in the previous class, but it's always good to buy and start and, and transplant maybe 20 to 30% more than what you're expecting to sell, just because of all those variables that we talked about before of pests and weather um, and germination issues. It's good to have that uh, kind of insurance built into your crop planning and your, and your growing. All right, some of the logistics. Okay, you got all that going. You've got your CSA plan, you've got your marketing plan, you're starting to recruit members, you've done your crop planning. Um, throughout the season, this is how things will operate. Think about developing a weekly CSA harvest estimate process. So this could be done on a daily basis, just as you're out in the fields, depending on how often you're coming to the farm, just to get a sense of how big things are, when they might be ready to harvest. Um, the way that we did this as staff for the Big River Farm CSA was May and I would walk all 50 acres once a week, which took about two to three hours on a Tuesday morning and chat with all the farmers who were present, um, bring a clipboard with a spreadsheet on it and write all the produce down on the left-hand side and then all the farmer names were all on the top. And we just go and talk to people. If farmers weren't there, we would just look at their, their plots and try to estimate how much stuff they had growing that would be ready to harvest the following week. We created this big harvest stretch um, that helped us kind of create an inventory since it was an aggregator program, all the farmers who were involved, um, and get a sense of what would be ready the next week to purchase from farmers to include in the boxes. Um, so from your perspective as an individual farmer, if you're creating your own CSA, it won't be nearly as complicated and intense, but a good, a good model that you could follow as well is, you know, do some record keeping, keep a clipboard, um, gain that experience and that knowledge of when things will be ready to harvest, and maybe do that on a weekly basis the week before you're planning to harvest and pack. Um, or like I said, if you're at the farm more often, it could be something that you just work into your daily routine is looking at your crops and knowing which ones will be ready to harvest um, sooner so that you can include those in your build-outs of your CSA boxes. Um, we have a very basic, like I mentioned, harvest estimate template that I'm happy to print out and provide to you all if you'd like to use it. Um, so let me know about that. And then in addition to doing the harvest estimate, next comes the build, box building, right? Harvesting the produce, washing it, and packing it into boxes for your CSA members. Um, for ease of uh, operations and also for some consistency, it's nice to have and depending on your, your personal schedule and your farmer schedule, it's nice to have these things be consistent. So maybe you're choosing one day to do your harvest estimates, you're choosing another day a week to, uh, to harvest your produce and do the washing, and maybe another day once a week to do the box building, um, packing those CSA boxes, and then making the deliveries to either customers directly, like you mentioned earlier, or to your drop site partners. Um, so something to plan out ahead of time and think about when you're developing your CSA. Uh, you'll get more experience with this as you go along throughout the growing season, but think about how long it will take to harvest and walk all of your produce. Um, I've known farmers who have combined some of these things into one day. So maybe they do the harvest estimate and then the following day they're harvesting, washing, packing, and delivering the produce. Um, that's a lot. I would not recommend that, especially if you're growing by yourself and don't have other folks who are part of your farm team. Um, but definitely something I've seen folks do in the past. Um, I'd recommend doing that kind of three-step process of like the harvest estimates one day, the harvesting, the washing one day, and then the, the deliveries on a third day um, to make it a little bit more manageable from a time perspective. And then finally, storage, cooler storage. Um, you probably all know we've got the two big coolers at Bay River. Um, you'll be assigned a, a pallet space for storing all your harvested produce to keep it fresh in the cooler. Um, nothing's concrete on this yet, but we did purchase a freight shipping container, which you've probably seen at Bay River by the pack shed. 
uh, with some grant money last year. I know Kajua and Pierce have been working on kind of some additional grant money this year to turn that into a to expand our cruiser space in the river. Um, and then in the future, if for some reason we can't continue renting the property, we'd be able to take that with us to whatever the next farm site would be. Um, and we wouldn't lose money trying to think much more into like expanding the existing pool, which is a lot more expensive um, and couldn't be taken with us. If we didn't farm there in the future and didn't offer a training there. Well, something, to, something to check in on as the growing season gets going. Reach out to us and let us know if you have questions about that being built out into a cooler and we can update you to throughout the process. Um, the last piece of that, that cooler storage, fridge storage, um, piece of the puzzle is think about your deliveries, like what your delivery vehicle is. If you're using a minivan, a pickup truck, um, if you have a refrigerated van, um, you probably wouldn't think of this scale as a new CSA farmer, but maybe something to build up to along like further down the line as you're growing your business and your customer base is purchasing a used um, box truck um, with a refrigeration unit attached to it, which is what um, we use because we have the access to it and the resources through the food group. And that way, you know, that gives more flexibility on having those separate days for the harvest estimate, the harvesting and, and watching and the deliveries without things going bad in the meantime. Um, if you're doing it all in one day, it's nice to have some type of refrigeration too, especially for leaky greens and herbs to make sure that things aren't wilting or looking sad when your CSA members do their pickups. Um, we primarily, all of our drop sites were unrefrigerated, but it was okay because they were either inside or if they were outside, we chose a spot that was in the shade so they weren't in direct sunlight for hours and hours before members picked up uh, their produce that week. So some other logistics to think about with deliveries and pickups from members. All right, next, packing, packing and deliveries. Um, if you're a seasoned Big River Farms farmer and you've been with us for several years, you probably have seen the packing line that we set up under the pack shed tents outside of that cooler, which is essentially just a bunch of tables connected to each other using those same plastic kind of mesh tops that you see on the greenhouse starting tables. Uh, and then maybe three, four feet next to it was a, a like roller top, tabletop line, which was basically metal legs with a frame on top and then rollers all along it um, to create kind of an assembly line for packing boxes. So each season we used to have between eight and 10 volunteers who would come uh, every Wednesday morning at 6.30 in the morning and help us pack 230 CSA boxes. And we back up that big refrigerated box truck to the end of the packing line and had a driver there who would take everything once it had been packed and put it onto the uh, delivery vehicle. Um, we used to do, for a couple of years, we did a customized CSA share, which I would not recommend if you're brand new. Um, there's definitely more labor and logistics that go into the customized shares. So I would suggest going the traditional model first, and maybe that's something you think about in the future too, um, as you grow and put more capacity and skills and gain more members for your CSA program. Uh, so the traditional model is really like, maybe you have one size share, or maybe you do two, and every week the same quantities and types of produce are in the two different sizes. So everyone who signed up for your small or your half share is getting the same types and quantities of produce. Same thing for if you've got a big share or a full share. Um, every member is getting the same quantities and types of produce um, with each delivery. The customized model um, meant that for two years, all 230 CSA members were getting different share sizes, different quantities, and different types of produce, um, which again added a whole bunch of additional logistics and labor to the back end to manage that all. Um, but some, some, some other things to think about uh, for creating your own CSA. Um, who's going to be doing the packing? Again, think about your, your capacity and your time and your labor. Um, are you doing it alone? Do you have a, a teammate who helps you farm that will be packing with you? Um, can you engage uh, local schools to try and get interns um, to help you pack? You want to gain that 
that experience, that knowledge of working on a farm and working with the local farmer. Um, but this is also a good opportunity to think about um, the marketing and the financial piece of your CSA puzzle. So one of the incentives for our CSA volunteers is they signed up for free. They weren't getting paid for their time. They wanted that experience. They lived in the city. They had that disconnect from where their food was grown, where it was coming from, who was growing it. So they they had that value of wanting to support local farmers and local food and eating healthy. Um, and so they were excited to come out to the farm and the volunteer to help pack. And the financial incentive we offered was um, what many farms call a work share um, as part of your CSA, which meant that we offered them a free CSA for the full season, for the, for the 18 week season. So they would come every Wednesday morning for a few hours to help pack 230 boxes. And in exchange, they got a free box of the same produce that CSA members were getting every week, which was anywhere from like 400 to 800 dollars in value for 18 weeks. And they got to take home that fresh produce that they got excited about because they were packing it and smelling it and seeing it on the back of mine. Um, and then they would take it home and get to eat it. Um, I'll get into this a little bit with member recruitment strategies for future growth, CSA membership growth. But from a marketing and financial perspective, also think about um, things like discounts to encourage members to recover each year, um, or ways that um, incentivize people to continue supporting you um, with a financial incentive, like a discount or a dollar percentage off. And finally, again, what type, what type of vehicle will you be using to deliver your CSAs to your drought sites um, and your CSA numbers? And will it be refrigerated or not? Communications, communication with members. This is a big piece of CSA. Um, like I mentioned before, the model uh, has included uh, the newsletter with every delivery. Um, so that can include multiple things, right? It can include, like I mentioned before, stories about you as a farmer or updates that you're hearing about how the growing season is going, new, new things that you're growing that you're excited about, or um, crops that you're excited to share with customers, recipes for how, how your CSA members can use the produce that they receive each week, um, storage tips and tricks. So you can include things about you know how to can, how to ferment, different ways to cure the foods that you're delivering, um, all sorts of ideas. But I would encourage you to develop a plan for creating these types of CSA newsletters um, that fit the same schedule as your deliveries. So this goes back to the idea of marketing too and putting some digital tools. Um, you can write you know, a simple newsletter in a Word document on a computer and then print it and include that in all of the boxes with the, the produce themselves. Um, there's different uh, software programs online that you can subscribe to and use uh, for email marketing, and they have templates um, with room for graphics and images and photos. Um, and you can compile uh, an email list from all your members when they sign up, and then use those emails in a digital email marketing platform um, to quickly create a digital newsletter and you just email it out to all your members at once. Um, a few that come to mind are MailChimp, um, Constant Contact is one. There are several different online platforms that are like that. If you do a Google search for email marketing platform, you should be able to find several. Um, and again, who will be doing this? Is it you, the primary farmer? Is it one of your farm teammates? Um, somebody that you've hired, a family member, a friend? <clears throat> Think about who's going to have the capacity and the time to do that, as well as not only the newsletter piece of communications, but customer service, like we mentioned before, is a big part of the CSA model to maintain those, those positive relationships with your customers. So say your delivery truck or vehicle breaks down in the middle of the day, that'll disrupt your uh, deliveries to all of your members or your drop sites. Um, the way we had things set up with all of our drop site partners was there was um, a delivery schedule for all 14, and then based on the needs of the drop site partner, there were pickup window slots on delivery days. 
So we did all of our packing and deliveries on Wednesdays each week. And each drop site had, you know, between like three to six hour time period where members could go there and go for CSAs. So if you have something happening like a stock breakdown, that's going to push back the delivery times. And you'll need to do that real time, like rapid response, customer service, and either contact the drop sites to let them know so they can reach out to all the customers. If you have a lot of folks who are picking up and things might be delayed by several hours and they get there and there's no reports available. Um, for big part now small and have a few members who have those personal relationships already, uh, it's easier to just contact them directly um, because they know you already and they want to support you. Um, other ways that might show up is if customers are dissatisfied with something they receive from you, um, whether it's in your control or not, they'll put that um, onto you as the farmer and the producer. Um, and the business owner. So something to think about, you know, again, if you deliver something and it sits out in the sun for hours and then it's built in when it gets picked up, you'll hear complaints from customers. So it's good to do follow-up communication with them to let them know what's going on or if you can offer um, something as a replacement in future weeks. But good to keep those lines of communications open, not only from that like storytelling, um, recipe sharing, newsletter side of things, but also from a customer service perspective of engaging folks and um, letting them know if things change on a dime and things need to be shifted because of uncertainties. It's a good way to keep those like relationships positive too and encourage people to come back in the future and having that, that positive customer service experience. Um, but there was a here just some fun ideas for different um, types of images you can include in a newsletter. Um, so maybe you take a photo of a chair as you're packing it at the farm um, and include that in the newsletter that you create, whether it's a printed document or a digital document. Um, if you take a digital photo with your phone or a camera, um, it could also be a good social media opportunity. If you have a branded farm social media page, um, that's a good way to continuously engage with your customers, with your CFO members, is to ask them when they sign up for your CSA to also subscribe to your social media pages. And then they'll get real-time updates and photos from you at the farm um, to build that, that relationship and build that connection. You know, if they're geographically distanced and they've never visited your farm, they'll see those real-time live photo updates of what you're doing and, and all the hard work you're doing to provide them with fresh, delicious produce. This one on the right is an example of a recipe photo that we include in the past CSA newsletter for creating um, salsa using ground cherries and cilantro and some other ingredients. Um, but just wanted to put here as an example of a graphic or a photo you could use um, in connection to a recipe that shows people how to use what you're delivering to them. Okay, so that's, those are all the steps to think about. Um, I'm sure there's many more steps from the ag agricultural perspective, right? As you're crop planting and seed starting and figuring out your beds um, to think about, but we really wanted to focus on the CSA model, what it is, and, and what to think about from that kind of programmatic business perspective. Um, so the final piece here is developing a CSA member recruitment and growth strategy. Um, again, who are you going to reach out to initially to be your, your members, those folks you have existing relationships with? Um, think about how you'll retain members from one season to the next. Um, this is an, an important thing to think about um, because you want those folks to continue to support your business from one year to the next. Um, and potentially you want to grow the number of folks who are part of your CSA. Um, so think about how you can engage and retain folks you know like i mentioned that like ongoing newsletters and communication is a great way because you're continually having those like updates provided and, and providing stories and creating that emotional connection to your business and to you as a farmer um you can like i mentioned before offer a discount to encourage people financially um offering that financial incentive to, to members to return so we did this in the past brf csa where in the fall, you know, within a month after our CSA ended, 
we would send out an email to all of our uh, members from that season, all of our CSA members, and thank them for being a part of the program, thank them for purchasing a CSA share, and then offering them 10% off if they signed up within the next week for a share for the following year. Um, so think about ways that you can do that from a financial perspective to not only retain folks, but to grow your membership base. Similarly, like if you're looking to recruit new members and it's folks that you don't know, you don't have an established relationship with, maybe you're doing a promotion in the spring um, to try and engage new customers and you're offering a financial incentive, but for a very short time period and, and using that sense of um, urgency, which is used a lot in marketing to get people to sign up and saying, hey, if you sign up this week, you'll get that 10% off. No, but don't wait because shares are selling out fast. And if you wait more than a week, you'll miss this discount. Um, who are you going to reach out to? How are you going to recruit these new folks? Um, I mentioned before social media advertising, um, which can be kind of hit or miss, and there's not great um, metrics on like the return on investment with some of that, but it's an opportunity to spend a, a little bit of, of money and then target. Um, who are connected to either your social media page, or you can target um, people based on zip code and, and social media apps like Facebook and Instagram. Um, if people have that information, their personal profile, you can create a paid ad from your branded business social media accounts. And then again, try and make sure that the people who see that ad in their news feed you on know, social media are in the zip codes where your farm is, the zip code where you live, or the zip codes around your drop site posts. <laughs> um, you can also, if you have the, the, the money for it in your budget and your marketing budget for CSA, you can things like news ads, um, radio ads. Um, I would recommend um, applying and being a member of those two CSA directories that I mentioned. You can sort of groom a directory, a stewardship project CSA directory, because they're relatively cheap. It's like 20 or 30 bucks for the season. Um, so it's not a ton of money up front. And also, we at Big River Farms used to offer, um, or we provided CSA members with a survey at the end of the season to kind of get feedback and uh, insights from the CSA members on why they chose Big River, um, what their experience was like, what they appreciated about the CSA, if there was like room for improvements, all sorts of questions. Um, but I bring it up because one of the questions was always how did they find out about us and why did they choose Big River over the myriad of other local CSA farmers? Like what stood out? Why did they connect with us? Why did they decide to purchase Big River Farm CSA? Um, the, the number one thing was they wanted to support our values, they wanted to support the brand, they wanted to support our new homes, farmers. Um, so that values piece used to be like top of the list. Um, convenience was always another factor. Um, if the farm or if one of our drop sites was close to where they lived or worked. Um, and then the other question I wanted to mention was um, how did you find out about the Big River Farm CSA? And the top of that list was always those two online directories, um, the Land Stewardship Project and the Minnesota Growing CSA directories. Um, so that would be my, my recommendation initially. Um, if you don't have a huge marketing budget, just connect to those two CSA directories and list your information. I will say newspaper ads are probably the most expensive thing you can pay for. Uh, the strategy we took at Big River was in ads in community neighborhood newspapers um, where our drop sites existed in the cities um, because they were distributed directly to people's homes. Um, and they have that geographic connection to where one of our drop sites is located. So those can get expensive fairly quickly. Um, it's cheaper to do black and white ads as opposed to full color ads. You get charged more per color. Um, so if you do decide to do a color ad, think about maybe only using two or three colors and doing the black and white, because that'll keep the price down. Um, the more colors you have, the more expensive it gets from a printing perspective. Um, same thing for radio ads, those, those can get fairly expensive pretty quick, just depending on how long the ad is. Um, you're paying per minute for airtime for something like a radio ad. Um, if you have connections to anybody in the radio world, um, or 
Uh, you personally just really like a specific station um, or the program in the offer because it aligns with your business values, reach out to them and just pitch, pitch ideas about doing some advertising or um, see if they're open to interviewing you to just talk to you about your farm business and what you do as a farmer. Um, one that comes to mind that we've worked with in the past is AM 950, uh, a local talk radio station. Um, they have a weekly program called Food Freedom Radio that we've gone on and advertised on for free um, for our, our annual conference, the Emerging Farmers Conference. So you can reach out to them and see if they're willing to speak with you just about being a farmer at Green River, um, interviewing you about your experience. Um, and that's potential free marketing to a radio uh, a radio program. Not necessarily a paid ad, but a way to get your information out to listeners who um, might connect with your business values because you're on a program that um, promotes local farmers and local food systems change. Um, one of the things to think about going back to that advertising flyer um, is creating something like that on your own or with some paid help, uh, paying for the printing costs, or if you have a, a printer at home, using that to come out, and then distributing them door to door in a neighborhood where you live. If you want to try and engage potential customers wherever you live, um, or taking them to the drop sites that you establish, especially if they're retail businesses or religious institutions like a church, a mosque, a temple. Um, you can think about taking things to, to a school too. If you have children who are in school, um, oftentimes religious institutions, schools, retail businesses will have community board boards that are either free or, or low cost um, to use. And you can post a flyer in a more visible space like that, try and engage customers you don't have an existing relationship with. Um, and further down the line, if you're growing your marketing budget, and you're trying to increase your membership and connect with new members. Um, you can think about doing things like cards um, or mailers targeted to different zip codes um, and working with uh, um, an agency that can distribute uh, printed materials that you create to connect with new customers. All right, we got about 35 minutes left. Um, before we jump into questions, though, um, I wanted to share some of the resources with you that I mentioned at the beginning of the class. Um, so I think Becca here is going to pop up the browser window. Um, Becca, I think you need to close out of the club. Oh. Sorry. So I mentioned that Kathy recently shared a resource with me that looks great. Um, it's a, a workbook for how to create your own CSA. Um, so it's, I don't know, maybe 12, 15 pages and each page has a different topic on it with learning objectives and additional resources you can check out for developing your own CSA. Um, and it's also into a 12 part video series, and each video is maybe 10 to 15 minutes long. Um, and the topics in the videos align with the topics in the workbook. So it looks like a really engaging, like interactive way to learn more about CSA. Um, so I can shoot this out to you all after class um, in Slack um, and upload the PDF of the workbook. Um, but yeah, if you scroll down on that page back you'll see there's a list of maybe 12. Sorry. To 14 different videos. Yeah, 12, 12 different videos. They give you some more insights into steps for, for creating your own CSA. You know, there's marketing, establishing customers, finances, um, planning for CSA. A few things we didn't touch on, like making sacrifices and managing stress. Um, you'll hear this come up in other trainings, but personal health and wellness is always something we try and encourage uh, you all as farmers to think about. It can be easy to get burnt out quickly um, doing a lot of farming work. So I know later this season we'll have, like in the spring at the farm, we're going to do another um, heat exhaustion training um, and some other on-farm safety trainings. So stay tuned for some of that. But yeah, I'll send all those resources. You can check it out. It's got a lot of great information in it. 
Um, here's the new the PDF, the workbook series that goes with the videos. So you can see this first page. Are you passionate about the CSA model? Helping you understand the history, the movements, um, that shared risk and shared reward idea. Um, what sets CSA apart from other business models? Lots of good information, and I like it because it's tied to these videos. So it's not just text um, or slides like your presentation today, but it's a little bit more engaging. Um, and then finally, I wanted to share um, ways that we, as the food group and bigger or farm staff, can provide some marketing support to you as a farmer and a business owner um, who's starting out at Big River Farms. So this page that I just went to is on the food group's website. It's called Meet Our Farmers. Uh, and we try to update this annually. So the folks who are listed on here are returning to Big River Farms this season. Maybe have been with us for a year already or two or three years. Um, it was a nice visual way to just show photos of everyone in the program, and then if you click on the photos, it'll go to individual farmer profiles. Um, so if you reach out to me and say, hey, we want to support your farmers, we want to buy directly from them, we love what you're doing, we love the values that you have and that the farmers have, um, how can we connect, how can we purchase from them? I'll send them to that main page so they can see everybody's photos and your business names or your personal name, and then they can click onto your photo and go to these profiles, which have a little blurb about your farm, um, your farmer photo. Uh, in the past, we did interviews with everybody and created blog posts, which is like more detailed information, kind of Q&A style, talk about all the farmers who were in the program. So you'll see here, like on Nathan's profile, there's that read more button that goes to his blog with additional photos and details about himself and his business. Um, the, the profile page also lists what you sell and where you sell it. So that's a good way to say, they're like, oh, hey, check out this farmer. They sell at this farmer's market. They sell to the school district. They sell to the food groups, uh, food shelf partners. So yeah, here's an example of a blog post we did and shared with our email list, our CSA customers, and our social media pages with additional photos and questions and answers. Um, that provided some more information about the thing and his business, his farm business. Um, the final kind of piece of that is um, this last tab at the top. We also have a page on the Food Group website that lists independent farmer CSAs. So these are the departing folks at Big River who are either starting or have already established their own CSA program. Um, and this is another great resource, again, to like help market your business, your independent CSAs, um, connected to the Big River Farms and Food Group brands since they're well recognized and established in communities that we And again, just another like one-stop shop for people to come and visit if they're saying, especially this year, because we're not doing Big River Farms every day to see this anymore. This is a good option for when people reach out and say, hey, do you have other ideas for like CSA farms I could connect with or know of other farmers who I could support, I can send them to this page on the website and say, yeah, we've got five farmers at Big River for their own CSAs um, and who grew food for you in the past if you were a Big River Farms CSA member. Um, even if they weren't, it's a great resource to just buy to them, buy from you directly if you have your own CSA. So similar kind of layout, um, list the farmer photos, the farm name, um, a little blurb about their CSAs. And they all have buttons that link to their individual websites, their brand farm business websites. Information and photos just about their CSAs, the different share sizes and types. Um, this is Yali Asio, which is Yali and Lucas, like on that. Um, Yali, I believe, is also going to be a farm mentor again this season. So um, I connect with her at the river, talk to her about her CSA and how she started it. Um, what her successes and challenges were. I'm sure she'd be happy to provide some insights from both her former perspective and her mentorship perspective. Um, but yeah, another piece to think about when you're creating your CSA is how are people going to sign up and pay you to be a CSA member? Um, it can be as simple, like if you go back and click on the Mumpod link on the BRF website, um, it can be as simple as just an online form which may have gone among others doing this year, um, as they're finding logistics behind the scenes still. They created a Google form, um, and I linked to it on our 
from our CSA page. So you'll see here, it'll, it'll pop up this Google form, which is like basic asking customers for basic contact information, email, name, address, the phone number, and the type of CSA share that they're interested in purchasing. So it can be as simple as doing something like this where you're collecting customer information and then following up you know, with a phone call um, and receiving payments not online through them. You know, maybe you're accepting cash or check um, or using a digital payment service on a smartphone like Venmo or PayPal um, or Cash App. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, the only thing to know with those apps is that there's going to be some sort of like service fee that they charge you as a way to make um, money for their business. So if you do use something like that, you might have to pay like a two or three percent service fee um, to them or something to keep in mind. But anyway, so it can be as simple as this, and you can create a paper form too that you're giving out to people. Um, all the way up to creating a website that's a little bit more in depth. Um, can we click on the launch screen, Rebecca? Yes. Thank you. So this is a good example of PRF farmers who are well established. They're going into their fifth year, I believe. Um, they've had a CSA for maybe three or four years now, and they built out this uh, website that's branded with their farm name some photos of the, of the team, the farm team. Um, and then it has information about all of their CSAs and, and nice, big, colorful, bright, engaging photos um, with pricing. And if you click on them, they'll show additional details um, about each one. And people can sign up right on their website. There's an e-commerce platform built to their website to accept payments. So it's kind of that one-stop shop for customers to come learn information, see some photos, Look at the prices and the drop sites um, and pay directly through the website. I think the, the platform they're using is called Squarespace, which I talked about a little bit in my markets and marketing class. Um, let me know if you want to learn more about that and I can connect with some resources. Um, I think they also offer free options as well as subscribe options on payment plans if you want to access more of their resources. But it's a nice website platform because it's it's very visual on the back end and has a lot of templates. So it's fairly like drag and drop. You can move images around, you can move around like word bubbles and text on the templates. Um, and you don't have to know uh, computer coding or HTML or things that are a little bit more complicated. So it's a little bit more accessible in that way. Um, WordPress is another one for, for website platforms. Um, a food group and Big River Farms use a WordPress for our website. And similarly, you don't need to know coding or HTML, and there's a lot of templates you can work with um, to design something that's um, simple and engaging and uh, more visual and gets text heavy. Um, the kind of mid tier option, which is a little bit more complicated than a form and less complicated than building out a whole website is if you want to use something like Square, which is a, another payment platform, digital payment platform, you may be familiar with like the little white square card readers that people have attached to their smartphones or like tablet device to accept credit card payments. Um, you could use something like that at a farmer's market to accept credit card payments from customers if they don't have cash. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because if you create a Square account with your farm business, um, I believe the device and the website are both free, and then you just get charged those processing fees for using their credit card service. Um, but the website version of it is free, and you can set up to create a one-page website with all of your farm business and CSA information and accept payments online through that digital payment platform and not have to build up a much more complicated website. So that's kind of a middle ground um, between a simple form and a full website. Um, and I can help you navigate some of that too and build out a square page if it's something you're interested in doing. But yeah, there's a few options for how we can support um, you as a farmer, your, your produce sales, and then also if you decide to start a CSA, um, how we can provide some support as your reforms and food and staff as well. Um, the final thing I'll say about this is, like I mentioned, because we as Big River Farms had a CSA that we operated as staff in the past, we got contact information for 300 plus people, our CSA numbers, ours in the past. 
um, who have been connecting to all of these folks who have their own CSAs this season as a way to encourage them to continue supporting Great River Farms farmers um, and to continue to buy CSA shares um, like they have in the past, just through a slightly different avenue. Um, so I can share um, your information with them too if you're thinking about starting a CSA in the future. And same with our job site partners and volunteers. Um, they're still all supportive of Big River Farms in the food group, as well as um, you all as farmers in the program. Um, so I can connect you with them if you're looking for drop site partners or um, if you're trying to build up a membership base for your CSAs, if it's something you're thinking about too. Um, cool, we've got about 20 minutes left and just open it up to questions if anybody has any, you can pass the mic around too. So how much does it cost to be uh, um, um, the price for you know for expenses or the price for members to sell? Okay, not for my customer though, not for my CSA customer. If I want to have a CSA, mm -hmm. how much does it cost? Uh, it can be quite variable depending on how many types, like the variety of types of produce you're putting in each box and the type of box that you're using all have different prices. So you can go from you know basic cardboard box to a waxed cardboard box all the way up to a reusable plastic bin with lids on it. Um, there's all costs, different prices. So yeah, it really depends on how many share sizes you have, the variety and type of produce in each one, how many members you have, and then the boxes that you're purchasing to put everything in. It's a big, big financial puzzle to figure out, but yeah, it's, it can be pretty variable. I don't know what you talked about. We also have to already have all of the clients distributing your produce to and know your sizes and your yeah. types yeah. before you can go and fill out an application. Yeah, yeah, before you promote or share information to the customers, okay. yeah, it's good to have all the planning steps, right. like you just mentioned, figured out on the back end um, so that that's all ready and you can know what to expect and how they can buy from you. And like how many different share types you have, how many types of produce are in each one, how often they're being delivered, where your drop sites are, how they can receive food from you, different payment options you accept. Yeah, everything we talked about through the like step by step process, it's good to have all that done before doing any marketing and sales mm -hmm. and trying to connect with customers. But yeah, when you're when you're creating those gear types um, and pricing things out, that's where you can kind of compare your expenses versus the revenue you project to receive and your membership goal for like how many folks you want to sign up um, to see how much money you'll, you'll be getting back based on like what you price the shares at if you have multiple share types. So, for example, we had last year we had 200 CSA members at Big River Farms. Um, and it was that aggregated program, like I mentioned, where there was like maybe 12 to 15 farmers farming at Big River participated and had contracts that we were sourcing from each week. Um, and we had 150 half shares or small shares and 50 full or large shares um, for members who signed up. And we set that goal before doing any marketing or online sales or advertising to say, hey, we know we need to hit 200 members to get this dollar amount of revenue coming in to support the program um, and some of the expenses that go with operating the CSA program. So that's how I would approach it, was just thinking about like your expenses, your model, how many shares and uh, types and sizes you wanna have and then what's your price those at and setting a member goal for recruiting people to sign up to get that, that dollar amount of revenue coming in to support your business. Did that, did that answer your question, Michael? Yeah, I think it'll just take research, trying to figure out, you know, the cost of seeds and boxes and um, how much you're spending from an expense perspective as a farmer or business owner. And then that can help guide your membership to see how much revenue you'll be getting in versus your boxes. Not so much of who are going to be my, my CSA client, which is me, 
think out of the CSC. Oh, I can see what you're saying. Yeah. Do I have to fill out an application and say, I want to be a CSC? Yeah. Um, now something like that. Not my client coming in. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, for you, for you, nothing, right? Because it's that direct, direct to consumer market yeah, that yeah. you're establishing. You want to do that. Yeah. So there's nothing that you have to apply. Like, like I'm like a farmers market. There's no like okay. other organization that you're applying to. It's all, it's all you internal. Okay, so it's just myself. Yeah. Getting my own. Um. Yeah. That being said, I also wanted to mention that there are farmers who have existing aggregator models, like that cattle producer I mentioned earlier, um, who work with produce farmers. And you could get you. That's another potential revenue stream or market opportunity. That's connecting to farmers who have. An aggregated model existing already and are looking to partner with produce farmers. So you could sell to them directly. It might, similar to a wholesale account though, where you're not getting the like full market rate for the produce you're selling because you're selling to them in bulk and they're essentially acting as buyers and reselling it to their solicitor members. But yeah, that's an option too. I don't think there's many farmers who have application processes for that. It's more of just chatting and establishing that relationship. So there aren't fees associated with that. Okay, if I don't have to have like insurance, probably they have to fill out an application and they have to accept you into the CSC you know, business yeah. for you to operate as a CSC farmer. But before, yeah, you know, no. that. Um, I would say the insurance part probably still applies just from a business perspective. Having insurance, insurance for your farm business, just personally. Um, but yeah, there's not stringent requirements like that. Similar to something like a farmer's market or a wholesale account. Oh. Yeah, right. So you were mentioning like most farms, they all have a, they work with other, you know, maybe a chicken, egg. Yeah. Do you remember when we were trying to figure out this aggregators, aggregators license? Mm -hmm. I imagine that they have an aggregators license to work with all these different. Yeah, that's a great question. I would imagine so. I haven't worked directly with them on that, but. Um, that could be something else to, to speak with them directly about. Um, I don't know that it's been, I know there's still some mentorship talks and agreements kind of in the works behind the scenes, but I think Heather is going to be a farm mentor this year as well. So she would be a good person to connect with on that. Um, I should mention too that I'm not sure when it's happening. Either in April or May, we're going to do a CSA panel discussion as part of the education program. Um, and we've done it in the past, and that's been an opportunity for you all as like new folks or returning farmers who haven't started a CSA yet to hear directly from bigger performance farmers who have. So um, we invited May and her daughter Mopa, um, Heather and Marissa from Mashi, all the folks that were on that page at their own independent CSAs to participate in. It'll be a panel discussion kind of style, similar to the wholesale discussion we had earlier this week on Tuesday. Or we'll, we'll all be up here and I'll be asking them questions and it's a good opportunity to learn more from folks like yourself who started at Big River who started their own CSAs, like steps they took, how they recruited members, how they chose their share sizes and types, any any external relationships like that with other, other farmers for aggregating um, successes and challenges, things to think about for future growth. So stay tuned for that. I think it should be coming up in the next month or two. Yep. Can you describe what we can expect of uh, the possible turnover rate for members and CSMEs? Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like that's also very variable from one point to the next. Um, I think a good rule of thumb is trying to have 50 to 60 percent of numbers you're trying from one season to the next, just for your own um, benefit. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things that play into that just based on like your capacity, um, how people feel that relationship went the first year they were a CSA member with you and that customer service piece, and also the their perception of like the quantity and the quality of produce they're receiving from you could impact their decision for the future years. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any like specific number I could give just because there's so many things. But I think a, a good goal is that like 50 to 60 percent 
the folks you're not returning, just so you have that, that support from going into the next, but also so you don't have to do as much marketing or advertising or member recruitment to try and hit the same number with your own more. How long did it take for you to reach that two important CSM um, yeah, good question. Lots of variables that went into that too. So the, the Big River Farm CSA existed for 16 years. Um, and I came on in 2020 in the spring. Uh, and as the pandemic was getting to it, um, it was also the first year that uh, Big River decided to customize their sugar. So there's a lot of learning in real time with that model. But prior to that, I discovered that one of the reasons we shifted from that traditional safety model to that customized model was to try and recruit more members because for five years prior to COVID, uh, Big River had been losing members uh, from one year to the next. There was a steady decline in membership. Part of that was just like market experiments, like control. Around that time, there was a lot of local food co ops that were expanding and building second and third stores. There was a lot of additional farmers markets opening up in the cities. A lot of the big box, like the national players, like uh, Target, Walmart, Costco, they were also starting to offer organic uh, foods and fair trade foods, which have kind of been the staple of like the local food co ops scene, which are running themselves from um, these more conventional brokers, national brokers. So there was a lot of additional opportunities to buy local, organic, healthy produce, um, which I think played into that decline in our CSA membership. I also say that from the perspective of working at a food co op four years prior to COVID hitting, we've seen a similar uh, trajectory of losing business to other um, retail stores because of the additional options that were opening up. Um, COVID had a like opposite impact though, which was unexpected and positive for the bigger reform CSA, um, where and, and, and local food costs had the same thing happen where pandemic hit, um, a lot of businesses closed down, protests were happening, and National Guard was coming to town, a lot of grocery stores closed temporarily, farmer markets closed because they were worried about COVID spreading. Um, and so there was that big like uptick in signing up for CSAs because of all that, um, because they wanted to make sure they still had access to healthy food, but also because they wanted to support local farmers and recognize that there was more resilience in local food systems than all the supply chain issues that were happening because of COVID um, and stores being shut down. Um, so we saw we saw that bigger reforms was a big boost. We went from 160 members to 230 in one season because of COVID. Um, and that number stayed steady for three years. Um, so I think between that point, as well as just a general like consumer trend of, of more, the bonus of like more places providing, like more opportunities, more businesses providing access to organics and fair trade and local foods is that it's built up more of a demand from the customer side. Um, and so there's, a, there's more demand now too from people who just want to support local farmers and local food. Um, that's all a long way of saying Things are variable. Lots, lots of factors that go into it. But again, something to think about as a farmer and a business owner is, is following some of those, those food and farming trends to see how that can shape your business in the future. Um, so, so since the people running a CSA, are in other words, some kind of food aggregator too, right? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, you can do it independently as a, as a farmer. Um, we operated as an aggregation model at Big River just because of our education model and having, you know, you and the other farmers be farming there. Um, and like I mentioned before, in Winifred there are farms that approach the CSA through that model because they're focused on a specific product or a niche product and want to bring in other farmers who are growing or producing other things. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely do it independently. Saying is like, for example, the ones who are not producing everything they have in their basket. So it's not like some kind of event or some kind of place where they can identify growers of a certain type of product 
Uh, not that I'm aware. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was Purdue Farmers Conference that we host every fall. I think there hasn't specifically that I'm aware of been like a workshop session or uh, anything specifically related to that. But I think it's a good idea. I could bring it to Marissa, who's our um, main conference uh, program person, to see what she thinks of it for this following fall. But just in general, I would say there's probably like less informal networking opportunities like that at other conferences, like the Marble Seed Conference, which is the biggest organic conference in the country that just happened in La Croix like a month back, um, and other local conferences. The thing you made me think about is it doesn't exactly fit that mold, but um, there's a few local food co-ops every spring to use CSA fairs, um, where they invite existing CSA farmers to one of their grocery stores. Maybe they close down the parking lot and like put up a tent and invite 20 to 30 farmers to come and set up shop like at a farmer's market. But you have a booth or a table um, with some market marketing materials for your business and your CSA and try and recruit members who align with your values as a, a local farmer and an organic um, producer because they already shop the food co-op that has those similar values. Um, so that's more for like member recruitment and customer engagement as opposed to like aggregating with other farmers. Um, you could go on to those two like online directories I mentioned and just reach out to those folks to like try and establish those relationships. That could be another opportunity because there's lots of good data and contact people there. Um, but yeah, I don't know of a specific event like that that intentionally is bringing folks together to aggregate for CSAs. It'd be great if there was though. I thought something we could bring to, to our team to see if we could do something like that. Some of them, the number who's everything that they sell is standard. Some of the farmers are looking for my Yeah, totally. Um, I know there's several like farmer who have graduated from Big River who use a similar model um, and start their own education farms to connect with various cultural communities they're a part of. Um, so that could be a potential like networking opportunity too, is connecting with those folks because um, they're multi-farmer operations that are looking for this too, to see if they want to collaborate um, on an aggregated CSA. Yeah, go so ahead. this is what you're saying. What I'm thinking is, if it's becoming easier for uh, other business models to take the organic local community aspect of CA, uh, CSA away from CSA, then in my mind I'm thinking in order to be competitive in CSA, I almost have to focus on specialty crops or crops that are not easily found in these from the target, the co-op, those sort of things, so that people would come to me for those because they can't find anywhere else. What would you think of that thing? Um, but yeah, I think just in general, that's a good approach to take, regardless of what model you're using or what market you're selling to. Like any way that you can differentiate yourself from the competition is always a plus for you as a farmer or a business owner. So whether it's what you're offering to your own CSA or what you're selling at a farmer's market, um, what you're selling wholesale to a grocery store. Um, yeah, it's always, it's always good to have something in the back of your pocket to differentiate yourself, whether it's through a specialty crop or a value-added product you're creating or a CSA um, type that you're offering. A great example of that is the Moshki Farms CSA. They have that like traditional vegetable oil uh, box that they offer their members. They also created kind of a niche uh, customized CSA share that they call cocktail shares. Um, and they market it as a way for people to experience their farm with all their senses, not just eating the food that they produce, but then also drinking their farm to these cocktail shares that they had. So I thought that was a cool creative idea to like create a niche product and a niche market to support their business while still being the best to see as they want. So what it looks like is a box they deliver once a month. They create, they grow, they grow the produce and they create uh, syrups and tinctures, dried teas, uh, dehydrated garnishes, 
and put all that in the box with like mixtures like little cans of soda or seltzer water and um, a recipe card that has four different cocktail recipes that includes everything they're including in the box um, except for the booze. Like the, the alcohol is the only thing that's not included, but it's kind of a fun niche thing that they're doing um, to differentiate themselves from other CSA products. So yeah, any, any ways you can do that through specific crops, different types of produce. Um, makes me think about some of the stuff we talked about during the wholesale class of like doing your research or the farmer's market class too, like going to existing uh, farmer's markets, grocery stores, food co-ops, seeing where it already exists, trying to figure out how you can differentiate yourself or provide produce or products that aren't um, as available or aren't existing on shelves. Same thing with CSA, like you can look up local farmers on those two online directories and get a sense of what they're offering and how you can differentiate yourself. I would also say you can probably take that approach from the customer side too, when you're trying to figure out like who your, who your target audience or who the customer you're trying to connect with are. Um, and see if you can connect on a um, cultural level to customers too, through like the types of products that you're doing. Um, like if you know, you know, the Hmong community really wants lemongrass or Thai eggplant or Thai chili peppers, maybe that's something you're growing because you're trying to connect with those folks directly as customers. Um, same thing could be said, you know, for a lot of different cultural communities, Latino communities, Black community. Um, all different races and cultures tapping into that from a farming and producer perspective of like how that guides what you're growing and the types of produce you grow. Okay, any, any other questions? We're, we're right at three, so 